Hi, it's Dr. Joshua Cooper, and it's such a pleasure to participate in this EP Fellow Summit. I'm going to talk to you about activation mapping in atrial flutter, specifically with regard to setting up a window of interest. One of the motivations for this topic came from a specific tweet that I recalled from Dr. Hardy, where she posted a wonderful picture of a mitral flutter ablation that she had performed. And one of the responses to her post pointed out that she found the early meets late boundary um, at the anteroceptal part of the left atrium. And yet she created a line of block, an ablation line, at the typical lateral part of the left atrium between the mitral annulus and the left pulmonary veins. And the response to that pointed out that the early meets late location is arbitrary in atrial flutter. And if you set up a DuPonti window, then the early meets late might be in an area of slow conduction, which might more likely coincide with where you perform the ablation. And so the question is, what is he talking about? What is this DuPonti window? And what is this arbitrary nature of the early meets late line in atrial flutter? So let's quickly first review how we're making an activation map. It involves picking a reference electrogram, usually from a stable catheter in the coronary sinus, and then as we move the ablation catheter or multipolar mapping catheter around the chamber, we're going to find electrograms and local activation times, each of which will be compared to the reference uh, electrogram, which is going to be designated as time zero. Electrograms that are later than the reference are going to be annotated and designated as a positive value. And electrograms that are earlier in front of your reference electrogram are going to have a negative value. Now here are two activation maps that we've created after all the points and local activation times were acquired and color coded with red being the earliest and purple being the latest. And on the left, you see an example of what a focal tachycardia will look like. This is a mitral annular atrial tachycardia. And you see radiating of colors out from the earliest red spot uh, in all directions. And red and purple are, of course, not next to each other because in all directions from red, you're going to migrate to orange, which is the next later uh, region, and then yellow and, and so forth. On the right, you have a macro reentrant circuit. This is counterclockwise right atrial flutter where the colors are going to progress in that counterclockwise fashion. And you will, in this case, get red meeting purple or an early meets late boundary, signifying the circuit has come back to its origin. On this slide, we have two examples of counterclockwise right atrial flutter. And here on the left, you have the circuit traveling around and the red meeting purple or the early meets late boundary appearing at the nine o'clock location. Uh, at the tricuspid annulus, which is, of course, not where we make the ablation line, which is down on the cabotricuspid isthmus on the floor of the right atrium. And here in this other example I showed on the previous slide, again, you have a counterclockwise circuit, but here early meets late is at six o'clock on the tricuspid annulus. So let's review why we have the same circuit in these two patients, but different color schemes resulting from our activation maps. For those of you who have seen my YouTube presentation on activation mapping, you'll recognize this slide. This is a simplified and pixelated diagram of the right and left atria, where you can see the uh, tricuspid annulus here, the mitral annulus over here. Here is our reference spot, our time zero coronary sinus catheter five, six pair of electrodes. And here in each pixel, in the right atrium, I've shown the local activation time, some negative values uh, being early, some late values being late compared to our reference. Uh, and once the entire chamber has been mapped, the earliest and latest activation times are uh, assigned colors of red and purple and everything in between. And here we see the counterclockwise sequence of colors and therefore the wavefront propagation with the early meets late period here at uh, nine o'clock on the tricuspid annulus. If we map the exact same rhythm, but we move the reference catheter to a different location, in this case along the crista terminalis, and let's say we use in this example uh, crista 3-4 as our reference, then the rhythm is going to be the same, but the local activation times with regard to this reference point are all going to be different with some negative values and some positive values, but each specific pixel is going to have a different value because it's going to be relatively different compared to this new reference time. 
So you're going to color code them again from earliest to latest, but notice here how the early meets late time when we move the reference is at a different location here over uh, at five o'clock on the tricuspid annulus in this diagram. So let's review why that happens. Uh, let's talk about a window of interest. This is what the mapper is going to see as that 3D map and color coding is uh, being constructed. You're going to have gating of the electrograms and the surface ECG. We pick a reference electrogram, in this case CS56, and we need to decide on a window of interest. And what does that mean? That means the electrograms that fall in this window are the ones that we're going to be including in the map. And usually people will pick a symmetrical window of interest that is surrounding the reference electrogram that is selected against which all local activation times are compared. Uh, so here in the darker black, you're going to see electrograms that are going to be included and in the gray grayed out are gonna be the electrograms that are excluded. Uh, and let's first talk about a focal tachycardia example. So in this focal tachycardia, we're going to put the mapping catheter in one location, find that local activation time, compare it to our reference, and we're going to move the catheter to another location, and then to a third location, and we're going to accumulate spots throughout the chamber and create electrograms from the earliest to the latest. And in this focal tachycardia, where there's a discrete P wave and electrical silence between P waves, you'll notice that the electrograms are all sort of clustered, uh, timed with the P wave, and you're gonna have an earliest electrogram that's gonna, of course, be represented on your map as red, and the latest electrogram is going to be purple. And importantly, notice that the previous beat, which falls entirely in this gray area outside our window of interest, is not going to be included whatsoever in our map because there are uh, excluded signals falling outside the window. And also notice that there is a big gap of time being electrical diastole between beats where there are no electrograms whatsoever. And so this makes it really easy to pick a window of interest and uh, there's a wide range of options. You can move the window a little bit earlier or a little bit later with regard to your reference point. You can actually even make it a little bit smaller or larger. And in all of these circumstances, you're going to be including all of the relevant electrograms and excluding the irrelevant electrograms. Uh, and that's really because you have this period of electrical silence and there's really no confusion or overlap between one beat and the next. So your color map, regardless of your window of interest, is gonna look exactly the same for this focal tachycardia. One way to think about it is that the tachycardia cycle length is much longer than the total time it takes to activate the chamber, creating really easy windowing. In contrast, in atrial flutter, there's no electrical diastole. The surface ECG reflects the fact that there's always electrical activity happening, and so there's no isoelectric line between P waves. When you pick a reference spot here, CS12, and then you start mapping the chamber, looking at electrograms, there's always going to be electrical activity happening somewhere because this is an ongoing circuit. Uh, so it's gonna be very important now how we pick our window of interest because what we include and what we exclude is now going to depend entirely on where we make that window. So if you make a symmetrical window around your reference electrogram, that's going to dictate directly which electrograms are included and which electrograms are excluded. So if we pick this symmetrical window around CS12, here is going to be our red location at that specific spot, that local activation time. Uh, but if you had moved the window a little bit earlier, not symmetrically around your reference point, you're gonna have a very different place that's represented as red. If you move it later, again, yet a third place that will be designated as your earliest spot. And likewise, if you uh, keep a symmetrical window around your reference, but you switch the reference point from CS12 to CS910, or if you put the catheter in the crystal location as per my diagram, uh, now you're going to make a new window that is symmetrical around this new reference point, and your earliest red spot is going to move locations to a different earliest electrogram because your window moved. Early and late is dictated by the location of the window of interest, not by the reference electrogram itself. But if you're centering your window around that reference point, then your window will move based on what you select as a reference location.
And in this, in this scenario, the tachycardia cycle length and the total activation time of the chamber are identical because you have macro reentry revolving around the chamber. And so you're going to get arbitrary windowing depending on what you choose as your reference and how you set up your window of interest. So what if you wanted to create a window of interest that gave you a consistent color scheme for macro reentry arrhythmias, irrespective of which reference electrogram you selected? The answer is found in this article authored by DuPonti, and people therefore refer to this technique as a DuPonti window. And in this manuscript, they describe the technique for creating a window of interest that is based on the surface P wave, not on the reference electrogram. And they come up with this formula that you can refer to this article or memorize, uh, but I prefer to remember the concept of how this window is created because you can pretty much estimate this very precisely by looking at the surface ECG and understanding the principle behind this formula rather than memorizing the formula. Uh, so let's review that um, on an actual surface EKG of atrial flutter. Here is a patient with atrial flutter, and I'm taking advantage of the gap between the first and second QRS complexes so that we can see a clean version of one of the flutter waves. So the concept of the DuPonti window is that the left caliper of the window is going to be placed exactly between the flutter waves in mid-electrical diastole. So how do you define systole and diastole? If you can, looking at all 12 leads on the surface, circumscribe a P wave or a flutter wave. And I've shown here with the red lines, the beginning and end of the flutter wave to the best of my ability. And realize since there's always something going on, the diastolic period really uh, is going to not be totally flat, but maybe has less amplitude than other areas of the tracing. So here I've determined what I think is sort of the beginning and the end of the flutter wave. And here in green, I've done the opposite. I'm looking at now electrical diastole rather than electrical systole in red. Uh, in diastole, I've shown the boundary of the end of the previous flutter wave and the beginning of the next flutter wave. Um, and if you pick the midway point between these green lines, mid diastole, that is where you would put your left caliper when you're creating this DuPonti window. And where do you put the right caliper? Well, that's going to be determined by the cycle length of the tachycardia. And you can make that just shy of 100% of the tachycardia cycle length. Some people use 95% of the cycle length. Some people use 90%. Some people say just use the full 100%. Just make sure that when you have an electrogram that's on the boundary, you are consistent in whether you assign something as early or late. Um, but here's your DuPonti window. And again, it's completely based upon the surface EKG, not on the reference electrogram. And notice that if we had picked, for example, this red spot here, CS56 as our reference electrogram, it is not going to be at the midpoint of the window. It is not symmetrical. If we made a symmetrical window, then it would, the window would have been shifted leftward. But instead, we made the window based on the surface P wave. And this will be somewhere within that window, but again, not symmetrically in the center. So there's your window of interest, and you exclude electrograms that fall outside that window. So let's review in summary the difference between picking a symmetrical window around an electrogram versus a DuPonti window. So here is flutter. We're going to pick CS56 as our reference electrogram. And we're going to pick a window of interest that is symmetrical around that reference. And let's take one very specific point in the atrium and use that local activation time and compare what happens to the color assignment of that one point, depending on how we make the window. So here's that one point, and here's the local activation time, and it happens to fall earlier than our reference, and it's therefore in the first half of our window of interest, and it's going to be assigned a color yellow, according when we've accumulated all of the local activation times in the chamber. If we take that exact same point, but we pick a different reference, let's say Krista 3-4, we make a symmetrical window around that reference point, that same spot in the atrium is now going to fall later than the reference and in the latter part of our window and be assigned, once we accumulate all the points in the chamber, a later color activation time, in this case a border between blue and purple. Let's review the same scenario using the same two reference points but with a DuPonti window. So here we create a window based on mid-electrical 
diastole as the left caliper, and we use the cycle length of the tachycardia to create the right-hand caliper. We use reference point 5.6 here, and now it's not going to fall symmetrically in the middle because of how we made the window. And here is that same anatomic point, the same local activation time, and it's going to be assigned color green, and it falls a little earlier than our reference, but it's a little bit more to the left of the midway point in our window. And what if we chose a different reference point? It's not going to matter in this case because our window is based not on the reference point, but again on the same surface EKG. And so even if we picked a different reference point, it's going to fall again asymmetrically within our window, but our same point in anatomic space is going to be assigned the same color because even though it's now later than the reference, it's going to fall exactly in the same location in the DuPonti window and again be assigned at that border between yellow and green, irrespective of what we chose as a reference. And interestingly, the last corollary is that if you uh, pick this mid diastole, then the very earliest color, red, is going to be falling most likely in the slowest activation time of the chamber because it's making the least amplitude of the flutter wave. And often that may coincide with the area that you may ablate if it's anatomically favorable. So that's a summary of how you make a DuPonti window and how it can be useful when you're mapping macro reentrant flutters.